Alright folks, so what I wanted to do today was a video on the basics of DMR and the reasoning is I get a lot of questions from people who are saying things like, hey Abe, how do I get into DMR? I'm really confused by DMR. What's DMR all about? And uh, there's a lot of information on the internet, but maybe it's not organized in a way that's consumable or, or maybe uh, it's overly technical and can be, can be confusing to folks who are, are new to DMR trying to get into it. So anyhow, today what I'm going to do is go through some uh, information that hopefully explains DMR from a beginner's perspective and will help get people into this aspect of the hobby. Uh, another thing that I wanted to say is that if you like this video, go ahead and click the thumbs up, subscribe, share it somewhere, leave a question below. Uh, it really does a lot to help the channel and help other people find the content, so I'd appreciate that. Anyhow, that said, let's go ahead and get started. All right, here we go. We're going to be talking about DMR for beginners. So what is this video going to cover? We're going to talk a little bit about what DMR actually is. And I'm assuming that you do have some ham radio or amateur radio experience. You're going to need it to understand some of the terms. And I'm targeting folks who are new or interested in the DMR. I'm not targeting folks who are experts. If you are an expert and I get something incorrect, I would appreciate you mentioning it below. Uh, what we're going to cover are some common terms. We're going to talk about some DMR networks. We're going to talk about getting a DMR ID, how to program your radio, and at the end I've got a collection of help and uh, resources and links. So what is a DMR? Uh, <laughs> this is where it gets a little confusing right at the beginning, right? Um, so it says here it's a limited open digital mobile radio standard. And what's nice about that being an open standard it means that other vendors uh, or all vendors are free to build equipment that works with this particular standard. It kind of lowers the price of entry so it's not as expensive as um, some other uh, digital modes that we'll talk about. And it's really designed around the premise of uh, preserving or using as little bandwidth as possible. So it says here what they wanted to do is to achieve a 6.25 kilohertz equivalent. Uh, DMR actually uses a 12.5 kilohertz uh, slice of bandwidth, but it does this uh, using time slots, and we'll talk about that later on in the slides. Um, you use a vocoder, the Ambi2 uh, vocoder, and what that does is it takes your analog voice and it encodes it into a digital signal where another radio with the same vocoder can decode the digital signal back into analog sound. This definition talks a little bit about uh, TDMA and how other, other protocols use it. It's uh, time division multiple access, and that's basically the time slot stuff that we talked about. Uh, we'll, we'll cover that in more detail later when it's time. With DMR, there are, are a number of tiers, uh, one, two, and three, and we'll get into that later on in the slide deck too. But again, at the bottom it says really the, the goal was um, of the standard was to specify a digital system that's low complexity, low cost, and has interoperability. Um, and I think that they've done that. This source, um, this information here is from Wikipedia, and I'll include the link at the end. So I did talk about some other digital modes, and we're not going to cover them in this video because they're kind of outside the scope. But I did want to mention them because you'll hear them mentioned whenever you're talking about DMR with anybody. Um, ICOM has an implementation that they refer to as D-Star. Yesu has um, a implementation that is uh, referred to as System Fusion. Sometimes they'll call it C4FM. Sometimes they refer to it as YSF. Um, also, there's Project 25, and this is used primarily by uh, law enforcement or public agencies. Um, in a tier three capacity for, for digital trunking. Uh, you can listen to P25 with many of the, what people refer to as a police scanner. And that's actually a lot of fun to do too. Um, so it might be something that you're interested in. And there are uh, two way uh, P25 radios, uh, for example, but they're very expensive. And as a result, you typically don't see them in amateur radio. So people say, how do I DMR? You know, what do I need to do DMR and how can I do DMR? Uh, the first thing you're going to need is a DMR ID. Now, in order to get your DMR ID, you're going to need to be a licensed ham. And people ask me all the time, they say, hey, I want to be able to listen to DMR. 
Now, there's some websites uh, that will allow you to listen to things that are being uh, broadcast over DMR. But in order to connect onto a DMR network, you, you need to uh, key up or transmit uh, your radio. Your radio needs to be programmed with a DMR ID so they know who is actually transmitting that radio. And then your DMR ID needs to be associated to an amateur radio license. So uh, what I tell people is, is that go get your amateur radio license before you start playing around with DMR. Um, people don't always want to hear that, but it's, it's really the truth. It's the best way and the cleanest way and the legal way to do that. You're going to need a radio with an MB2 vocoder, and we talked a little bit about those earlier. People will say to me, hey, Abe, can I use my Balfang and a hotspot? And the answer is no. Um, you need a vocoder between your, your rate. You need one in your radio and then your uh, DMR hotspot forwards that encrypted or uh, the digitized signal. The last thing is, is you need to be able to connect to a DMR network or a standalone DMR repeater, which would be a single node network, I guess. You could argue that. Um, repeaters are often networked. Um, which makes them very convenient to use with things like hotspots. So you're going to either need a, a repeater that's uh, DMR capable or a, a hotspot. And here I refer to the hotspot as an MMDVM, which is um, a multimedia digital voice modem. So you'll see that uh, reference throughout the, these slides. So I guess the first question would be, well, how do I get uh, a DMR ID? And I mentioned be a licensed uh, amateur radio operator. You, when you go ahead and you apply for one of these, you're going to need to type in your call sign. And then go over to uh, radioid.net. And this is uh, a screenshot of that website. And they talk a little bit about what you need to do and how you apply for your DMR ID. Once you get your DMR ID back, you'll program it into your radio and then you're off to the races. This is what we use here in the United States. It's my understanding due to some data privacy rules, um, you may register for your DMR ID differently in parts of the European Union. So here's where folks will say, well, what is a DMR network? And uh, the most basic way I could define it was really, it's a collection of repeaters and hotspots or repeaters or hotspots that are networked together over a TCP IP, which is a uh, uh, protocol that's used uh, for uh, digital communications or networking. Um, these devices, they pass traffic from one to another. Now you can do this on a private network or you can do it on a public network like the internet. Networks can be standalone or cross-connected to other networks. Networks can be cross-connected to other digital mode networks. So some examples of what I just said, which might seem like gibberish, is that um, a DMR mark repeater can cross connect to talk groups on Brandmeister, which is another network. DMR mark is a network, Brandmeister is a network. Both of them may have talk groups with the same number, like uh, 3001, for example, which is, uh, I believe, the North America uh, talk group. Now, what these networks could do is they could say, hey, we're going to stand alone and we're not going to link our 3001 talk group to a talk group on Brandmeister. Uh, for example, but there is a lot of interoperability and pe most of the time people will link the talk groups together. Another example is uh, Brandmeister talk groups can cross connect to Yesu system fusion uh, reflectors or groups. So uh, Yesu has something called America Link and that's where all the folks on a system fusion um, radio may talk uh, across the United States. Well, Brandmeister can create a talk group that connects to that America Link on the back end on a server side and allows you to pass traffic from one mode to another mode. So that said, people might say, well, what DMR networks are there? Well, the one I mentioned earlier, DMR Mark, uh, I think is the granddaddy of all the networks. It was developed by a uh, Motorola Amateur Radio Group. Um, a couple other networks that came out of Europe would be DMR Plus and Brandmeister. Uh, there's a little bit of a newer network, it's called TGIF, and uh, it's my understanding this was born out of a talk group on Brandmeister for the Thank God It's Friday group. And uh, they're building their own, their own network that does have uh, cross links into other talk groups on other networks. And uh, there are more and they keep growing. People, people like uh, building DMR networks, I suppose. So people now say, well, what DMR radio should I buy? And uh, I do a whole video on this. It's a, it's a shameless plug there, and I'll link this in the description where you can check it out. 
but uh, it really depends upon what your budget is. One of the things uh, I want to say is, is that DMR is not as cheap as getting into uh, analog or FM ham radio, for example. Um, you can get cheaper DMR radios, but it really comes at a cost. Um, and that cost is flexibility uh, in programming. You may need to do uh, your programming from a computer and uh, not be able to program it from the front panel in the field, for example. Um, also, the radios are a little bit more difficult to use because of lack of features on the radio. Um, you also may need to make a determination between getting an HT and a mobile. I typically re recommend um, for folks to get an HT, um, having a mobile station, like uh, one in your car or, or using one in your house as a base station, is a lot of fun, and uh, you can get out there really well with like 25, 50 watts and a good antenna and, and pick up a lot of repeaters and do some, do some talk there. But with an HT, it's, it's light. You can throw it in your backpack. You can use it with a hotspot, which I definitely recommend, uh, and we'll talk about hotspots more. But uh, with an HT, I can take my hotspot in the car with me. I can take my hotspot to work, and I've got my HT that I can just put in its, its charging station, charge it up. And then um, I can do DMR on the go in a way that, that works really well for me. So I keep talking about these things called hotspots. And people say, well, what, what types of hotspots are there? Um, and uh, what is a hotspot? Well, <clears throat> a hotspot is basically a little repeater that uh, you, you can take, take with you. And uh, you can program this repeater to connect to any of the networks that we discussed um, earlier and then you can use your radio to control the hotspots to switch between different talk groups um, and then you can communicate to different groups of people uh, all over the globe. Um, these are generally connected to the internet. Now you can use these in a standalone configuration at, uh, at your house and have a little small um, hotspot repeater but what you use these to do is connect to the internet and then that way you connect to the, repeat, the, the DMR networks uh, via the public internet like I spoke about earlier. The uh, the Cadillac of hotspots is really the Shark RF Open Spot 3. Uh, I don't believe they sell their Open Spot 1 anymore and uh, I, I'm not sure about the Open Spot 2. And this uh, hotspot has a battery so you can charge it up, you can put it in your pocket, it's very small, it's very lightweight, uh, very easy to program. It has a proprietary operating system that it uses. Um, but it's expensive. It's about 300 bucks, I believe. Uh, down in the price range a little bit for around 200 bucks, uh, you can get a zoom spot. And basically, this is a, uh, a board similar to the MMDVM board I have on the screen that uh, connects to a Raspberry Pi and runs a, an application or operating system called PyStar. Um, it's very popular, very common. Uh, you can buy them pre-configured or they're kind of like a, a DIY project where you assemble them and, uh, and program them yourself. <clears throat> the Jumbo Spot is very close to a uh, copy or clone of a Zoom Spot. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a little DV, it's a MMDVM board that connects to a Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi runs Pi Star. Uh, Blue DV, I'm not as familiar with these, but I believe they are, they are uh, pre-built devices um, that you can pl plug into your computer. Uh, you don't need to use Wi-Fi, and um, it accomplishes the same task. Also, you're going to see a variety of generic, cloned, and custom MMDVM boards. Lots of people have gotten into the hotspot game, and there are really countless types of hotspots that are out there. Um, what I did is I bought a jumbo spot for 105 bucks off of Amazon, and uh, I'll have some links below where you can uh, you can purchase some of these things. Uh, I bought that, and then I had to configure the Pi Star uh, configuration on that to get it to work with my radio and connect to my Wi-Fi, and it worked great. Uh, so what I did later on is I had a spare Raspberry Pi, and then I bought uh, another jumbo spy uh, jumbo spot board, and then I built my own. Uh, hotspot from scratch and I have a video on my channel for that if you're if you're interested but it's a fun project it does uh, run on the Raspberry Pi like I talked about um, so it requires you to have a little bit of a background or some experience with Linux um, nothing too complex or, or, or uh, crazy so people say well what is what is Pi Star um, it's an application that runs on top of Raspbian on a Raspberry Pi that basically turns your your Raspberry Pi into that digital modem that we spoke about earlier. 
Um, PyStar does have uh, an image that you can you can get, and then you can install that onto your Raspberry Pi, and it covers both the operating system or an application. So folks will refer to PyStar as an operating system or as an application, but it's my understanding that you could actually take a Raspberry Pi, run in Raspbian, and then install PyStar on top of that. Anyhow, what I would recommend is you just go and you download an image uh, from PyStar. So a lot of the common terms that you hear uh, in DMR uh, are listed below. We're going to walk through them. And uh, people say, well, you know, what's a talk group? And, and basically a talk group is like a chat room. It's a collection of individuals who have connected to a room uh, that they call a talk group. So if I get my radio and I connect to the Brandmeister network and I fire up talk group uh, 3100 and I say, hey, this is a smoking ape. Anybody out there that can give me a signal report? And uh, everybody who is monitoring or listening on that talk group will hear it. And anybody's free to come back and say, hey, ape, I got you. You sound great. Um, or, hey, ape, you sound modulated. Don't hold the mic so close to your face. Um, and everybody hears that. It's a, it's a public forum. It's a public setting. It's, it's basically as if you were, you were in a chat room. Now, you can make what's called a private call to a person's uh, DMR ID. And that way, only the two of you can hear that. But it's important to remember that any communication over a DMR network is unencrypted. It is uh, able to be uh, intercepted and heard by other folks. So nothing's really private. You know, people say, hey, Ape, I want to talk to somebody and don't want anybody to listen. Well, you can do a private call, but um, it's possible that people will be able to hear you or listen. The uh, next thing I want to talk about are digital contacts. And so when you have your radio, this is the, your buddies or, or people that you're going to talk to outside of talk groups. Um, they also have another use on some, some radios will allow you to enter uh, digital contacts like my BTEC DMR662, which I love. Um, I can put 200,000 digital contacts in there, which is the entire DMR database. And uh, that way, if I'm on a talk group and somebody else is communicating, I can see their call sign, their location, um, and information about them. So instead of remembering their DMR ID, which typically comes across first, um, I can see their call sign and refer to them by their call sign, or I even see their name, and then I, I can say their name. And for me, it's a lot easier to refer to somebody by their name or call sign than their DMR ID. You'll hear people talk about, uh, that's a tier one radio, that's a tier two radio. Most of the amateur work is done at tier two. Um, and I have a slide dedicated to these tiers, so I'm not gonna go into great detail. But essentially DMR, the DMR standard, does have definitions and specifications for operating in these different modes, tiers one, two, and three. People will talk about zones and say, well, what is a zone? And I like to think about these as a bank on uh, your older FM uh, or analog radio. So on my radio, I, I program two zones. I program a zone called home and I program a zone called work. And that's because I work down the road a little bit. And when I'm at home, I can listen to certain repeaters here. And when I'm at work, I can listen to other repeaters. So for me, I've just created two zones and that way I can segment my channels uh, based off of those zones. Maybe I want to scan those zones or maybe I just want to scroll through them. It makes it a, a little bit easier to organize my channels. Another thing you'll hear people talk about are color codes. And people will be like, well, what is all this color code mess? I can't figure out how to program a radio. I've never heard of a color code. <clears throat> uh, color code is just another word for uh, CTCSS or uh, PL tones that you use on your FM radio. It's basically a tone that's applied to your signal that lets the repeater know which, uh, which way to communicate with your radio best and you let your radio know which way to communicate with your repeater. I believe there's nine color codes. I could be wrong about that. But they're, you know, color codes one through nine. And your repeater would designate, hey, for this particular talk group or for this particular um, repeater, you want to use color code three, for example. Um, and then there's channels. And channel is just like it is on your regular radio. It's a collection of a frequency, uh, color code, um, and uh, information like that. And uh, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more about programming channels in a, in a future slide. Now, one of the things I really love about my radio is it comes with something called promiscuous mode. 
And typically your radio will only listen to a color code, a time slot, and a talk group that it's programmed for. With promiscuous mode enabled, I can listen to a repeater and I can listen to both time slots and I can listen to both of the, uh, or any, in any color code on that repeater. So I can hear all repeater traffic, not just traffic that's programmed specifically to my channel. It's a little bit of an advanced feature, but it's really handy. Now, something that you're starting to see more and more is a feature called Talker Alias. And uh, DMR, uh, Brandmeister, um, and Pystar take advantage of this. And this is uh, information that can be associated to the digital signal that you're using on your radio. Um, and typically that would be call sign. And so in the older DMR systems and on some of the cheaper radios, uh, when you're talking, you only see somebody's DMR ID. And like I mentioned earlier, it's kind of hard to refer to people by these long DMR IDs, um, which is basically just a string of numbers. With Talker Alias, I can see your call sign, and then that way I'd be able to, to understand or put, put an identity to the, to the voice that I'm hearing. And then the last thing uh, that you hear people talk about a lot are code plugs. And people say, well, code plug is basically all the programmed information in your radio, and, and that's exactly what it is. If you think about uh, when you use uh, Chirp to program your, your Yaesu FT60 or your Baofeng UV5R, you have all your channels in there. You have radio-specific information around um, uh, frequency uh, bandwidth. You have information about your startup screen. You have uh, information about power settings. All of that's your code plug. Now, I, I recommend that you build your code plug from scratch. I know a lot of people are like, where can I get a working code plug? Well... A lot of people read code plugs and they don't know what they're doing. So if you take their code plug and use it in your radio, you might not have a good configuration. The other thing is, is you need to make sure that your radio is programmed specifically with your DMR ID. So when you get a code plug, you need to change that or make sure it doesn't have somebody else's DMR ID in there. But uh, a code plug is just all the information that your radio requires to work. It is not the firmware of the radio. It's the configuration that the radio software uses to operate. So here I did talk a little bit about um, the different tiers. Um, DMR Tier 1 is really in intended to be used for short-range simplex communication. That said, you can do TM, uh, DMR Tier 2 simplex communication as well. Um, most of the uh, amateur radios I mentioned earlier uses Tier 2. And that's where it takes advantage of uh, the two-slot TDMA or time, Div time division multiple access protocol. Um, and they do this on 12.5 kilohertz channels. Now your FM analog radios operate on uh, 25 kilohertz channels. So this is one half of the spectrum or one half of the bandwidth. Um, that was the goal. And if you remember from the first slide, uh, the goal is really to get it down to 6.5. So what they do, if you look at the bottom of, uh, of the screen, you'll see I've kind of put a, a diagram in there that shows the 12.5 kilohertz um, bandwidth and it's broken into time slot one time slot two time slot one time slot two uh, and so on and those are 30 millisecond chunks of time and what the radio does is it, it switches back and forth between the two different time slots um, where it will send or receive digitized information um, and that is the premise behind tdma uh, now tier two also can take advantage of simple messaging uh, and gps data so I can send text messages on my radio. Um, it's kind of difficult, but it's helpful at times. And I can also send coordinates uh, information uh, via GPS. That's different than a radio that takes advantage of APRS, which also uses GPS data, but you can send more than just position information with APRS. And then the next thing is, uh, is tier three, which is basically tier two with trunking capabilities. Um, this exists in ham radio or amateur radio but is not very common so most of the radios that you're going to see are going to be dmr tier 2 radios and you'll be operating on dmr tier 2. so this is where people say how do i program my radio or what's in a code plug and i tried to make this as simple as possible so when you program your radio you typically want to add in what i do is i add my zones first um, because I'm going to have to add my channels to zones, and it's nice to have the zones there to add my channels to. But before I can program channels, I enter the talk groups that I want to use into my code plug software. 
Now, I'm just using this general depiction here because everybody has a different type of radio. All the radios come with their own proprietary software. Um, I do have uh, programs or videos on my channel that show writing code plugs for particular radios if you're interested. But generically, these are the things that you're going to need to get your radio up and running, in addition to your radio-specific settings like your DMR ID. So after the zones, what I'll do is I'll enter in all the talk groups that I want to use, and there's probably about 50 of them that I want. Now you could go uh, to Brandmeister or DMR Mark, and you could download a spreadsheet with all the talk groups and put them in there. But if there's talk groups, uh, let's just say like Spanish-speaking talk groups, I'm not going to use those. Uh, it's not that I don't like Spanish, it's that I can't speak Spanish or understand it. So those talk groups don't make any sense for me to have. My radio already comes predefined with the color codes as well as time slot 1 and 2. Now, some radios take advantage of a feature called RX groups, and that means that those are groups that you can transmit to. Um, so you would want to add your talk groups to those. But when you program a channel, now a channel will have a number, so channel 1, it'll have a name, and you could call it local repeater. Um, and then I want to add a talk group on there, so I might add uh, America, or, or, or what, do, what do they call it, um, 3001. I might want to add that talk group to my channel. And then my repeater may serve up that channel on color code 2. So then I would need to go ahead and add from my color code setting CC2. Um, and maybe it's on time slot 1. So then I would just go ahead and I would pick uh, TS1. And then I would enter in the text or the transmission frequency and the receiving frequency of the repeater. And I'm done. There's my channel. Um, it's that simple. Now, people will make this a lot more complex because of the terminology like color code and time slot. But you just associate one of your color codes, just like you would a PL tone, um, to your channel, and then you add, add the only thing that's really new is the time slot, because the radios you program now don't use that TDMA functionality. Once my channel's done, I can add that to a zone, and we talked about doing that for organization earlier. Um, you know, my zone will have a, a number, zone number one, name home, and then channel one. Uh, the other thing I would want to do is I'd want to add my channels to scan lists and uh, some radios have a feature where you can group channels by scan lists so these might be um, let's say I've got three repeaters that are local to me and I want to be able to program different talk groups on those repeaters and I want to scan them to monitor for traffic that's why I would use a scan list so it's really that simple when you think about it but uh, I don't really ever see a, a, a a picture or a diagram that kind of outlines it this way. So the next thing we talked about digital contacts and different radios hold different amounts. Um, right now the DMR database is around 150,000 users. I can import that entire uh, database into my radio so that way I can see that information that we discussed earlier. I get mine off of amateurradio.digital um, they do require a 12 month donation of 12 bucks. There's other places and I'll have some links below where you can get the uh, DMR uh, digital contacts database. Um, sometimes the format's different and requires you to put into an Excel spreadsheet and change it around a little bit to get it into your radio. But um, amateurradio.digital has a wizard where you can put in your radio type. Um, you can filter different uh, um, different contacts based off of region, uh, geography, things like that. Um, and it comes down into an Excel file that is specific to your radio and is very easy to import. Um, I have a few DMR radios, so for me, $12 is uh, not a big deal um, because I usually update my, my contacts uh, once a month. Anyhow, I love this site. It's easy to use um, and it's very convenient. Now, people say, well, you know, I'm trying to get into this. I bought my radio, I bought my hotspot. I'm, I'm struggling. Uh, where and how can I get some help? And uh, these are two websites, uh, Amateur Radio Notes and DMR for Dummies. Amateur Radio Notes is fantastic, and it goes into uh, great detail on how to set up and use and configure your Pi Star. Uh, if it wasn't for that website, I don't think I'd be, in, and be using DMR right now. Uh, DMR for Dummies is a little bit more basic, and it might be a, a good place where you can go to learn a little bit more detail about specific topics that we've covered here. And then just here are some resources that, uh, that I'll link below, most of what I've referenced. Um, the last one, a shameless plug, that's in my playlist for DMR radios that I've reviewed, used, or done tutorials on.
So anyhow, that's really it. Um, thanks everybody for watching and putting up with this long video. Uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, go ahead and uh, post your questions below and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks everybody.